may take your seats. Well, happy birthday, Jesus, and Merry Christmas, Mars Hill Church. What a great day it is. You can be praying. We've got 20 Christmas Eve services across 13 churches in five states tonight. Lots and lots of people getting together to learn about Jesus. Thank you for joining us, and we're doing this service here at Mars Hill Bellevue Family Style, which means all the kids are in here. And if your kids are yelling, screaming, freaking out, praise God. Keep them in the service. We love them. We're glad to have them. Jesus came as a baby. He was probably pretty good in church. But even if your kid isn't, we're glad to have them. We'd rather have you with your loud kid than not have you at all. Amen? Amen. And I'm a dad. I got five kids. I can handle yelling kids. That's not an issue for me. I'll be fine. And all you kids, we love you. Merry Christmas. We're so excited to have you. And it's my great joy to open the Bible as we're celebrating Christmas together and look at the very first Christmas. So if you have got a Bible, go to Matthew chapter 1. We're going to be in verses 18 through chapter 2, verse 2. You ready? You ready? All right, you should be excited. It's a good night. It's a happy night. It's a fun night. I'm excited. And my gift to you is a fairly short sermon. If you're new, it will not feel like a short sermon. But if you've been here a while, you will realize it's a fairly short sermon. All right, Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took uh, it. I'm so excited. I stopped reading. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. So I want you to know this. If you're new, or, or maybe you're even new to understanding Christianity in the Bible, the Bible is about historical things that actually happen. This is where Christianity is different than philosophy or spirituality. It's really about history, that God who made the world is at work in the world and shows up in particular times and ways to say and do particular things. And so when the Bible tells us Jesus came this way, now we know exactly how Jesus came because God was faithful for us to get a credible accounting historically of how he came down from eternity. And it tells us that his name is Jesus Christ. And this, this gives us a lot of information. Jesus means God is our savior. And I want you to know, some of you would put Christianity in the category of other religions and Christianity does not fit in the category of other religions. Other religions teach us how to save ourselves, how to do things to become acceptable in the sight of God. You need to reincarnate and pay off your karmic debt. You need to live a good life. You need to be a good person. You need to go to a sacred place. You need to have your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds in some way. Christianity is antithetical to that. It's not that we save ourselves, it's that God is our savior. And ultimately that God who is our savior is this God man, Jesus Christ. And so it's, it's Jesus, God is our savior and Christ. And that means the anointed one, the special one, the unique one, the chosen one. And so what we cannot do is allow Jesus to be put in a category of just a good man because he is in fact the God man. And so all of history has been anticipating and awaiting the coming of this person, Jesus Christ, the most important person, the most famous person, the most significant person in the history of the world. No one, no one has made an impact or left a legacy like Jesus. And Matthew says, here's how he came into human history. Here's the story. Here's the facts. Here's exactly what happened. It took place in this way. When his mother, it's going to talk about his mom. Kids, what's Jesus' mom's name? Mary. Good job, kids. I'm going to ask you questions. Jesus' mother's name was Mary. Now, you need to get this in your mind's eye. She's probably young, maybe a teenager, junior high, high school kid. How many of you girls are junior high, high school? How many of you are not ready to raise God? <laughs> not ready. <laughs> right? She's probably a teenager. She's poor from a rural small town. Any of you from a rural small town? Okay, congratulations. You got out. Good for you. Mary was from a small rural town. She's a poor gal, peasant family, probably a teenager. The story continues. When his mother Mary was betrothed, this is a little different than our culture. We have dating, engagement, marriage. They had something that went dating, engagement, betrothal, marriage. It was more than what we consider engagement, but less than what we consider marriage. You didn't have the consummation of the relationship. 
but you were legally obligated to one another. So how many of you gals were recently married? Maybe this is your first Christmas as a wife. Maybe you're engaged to be married. Maybe you're here at church hoping to meet Mr. Wright, right? Are you thinking about your future, getting married? Mary's planning her wedding. How many of you women remember that? She's got her husband pick. They're not yet married, but they're more than engaged. They're betrothed. They're legally obligated to one another. Probably the day is set. Maybe even the invitations have gone out and everybody knows they're getting married. It's one of the most significant times of your entire life. One of the most exciting times of your entire life. And here's this rural, poor, teenage gal. Betrothed to who? What was Jesus' daddy's name, kids? Mary was his mom. What was Jesus' daddy's name? Joseph. Joseph. Kids are doing great. Nice job, parents. All right. Betrothed to Joseph. Before they came together, single people, write this down. Super important bit of trivia there. They didn't come together until after they were married. Write that down. We forgot that, but a lot of good information in here for all of us. These single guys don't look as excited as I was anticipating. But um, before they came together, she was found to be with child from, how did she have a baby? The Holy Spirit. Okay, guys, this guy, Joseph, poor, probably a teenager, rural, small town. They probably grew up together. Dozens, hundreds of people in their small town. Any of you grew up in a town like that? You know everybody. There's not a lot of people your age. You're trying to figure out who you're going to marry, and it's a short list of options. Mary and Joseph probably knew each other, probably grew up together, probably worshiped God in the synagogue together. They did some life together. Now they're engaged to be married. Joseph is a man who's a carpenter. He's a hardworking blue collar guy, swings a hammer for a living. And he's picked his wife. It's Mary. They grew up together. He loves her. He's now ready to become a husband. This means that he's got a job. Single guys, write that down. More helpful information. He got a job. (laughs) Notice the order, a job, then a wife. Super important to get that order right. So he got a job and then he got a wife and they're getting ready to get married. And then she is pregnant. Now, men emotionally just go there for a minute. You're a virgin. You thought she was too. You grew up going to worship God together. She's a godly gal, sings to the Lord, memorizes scripture, knows and loves the Lord. You have not had any contact with her that's inappropriate in any way. She comes to you and says, we're pregnant. Your thought is, we're not pregnant. You're pregnant. Can you men imagine how emotionally devastating this was for Joseph. This is your dream girl. And now it's become your nightmare. You've waited your whole life to be with this woman. And, and it seems as if she's betrayed you in, in the most horrific way, in the most public way. How many of you men would not even know what to do at this moment? Joseph is left with a horrible, horrible set of options And her husband, Joseph, being a just man, he's a good man. He's a godly man. He's a well-intentioned man. He's not a perfect man, but he's a man that is worthy of imitation and emulation. He's a good man. And he's a young man. He's trying to figure out, what do I do? I I don't want to hurt this young woman. I care for her. Obviously, she's been unfaithful to me. That's what he's thinking. I need to find a way to get out of this. I'm not gonna spend the rest of my life with a woman who's dishonest and dishonorable. Her husband, Joseph, being a just man, an unwilling to put her to shame. Men, so important that we make it our ambition not to put women to shame. What he believes she has done is shameful, but he is not going to add to her shame. Resolve to divorce her quietly. I'll find a way out of this. We'll untie this legal obligation. She'll go on with her life and I'll go on with mine. And I'll try to do this in the most delicate, sensitive, loving, godly way that I can, even though I'm devastated. I want you men to see how wonderful he is with this woman. But as he considered these things, He's thinking about it. He's praying about it. He's not rash. He's not rushing. Kids, who shows up to talk to Joseph? An angel of the Lord. 
an angel of the Lord. Do we believe in angels? We do. We believe in angels. We believe in the miraculous, the supernatural, and angels are created beings. They don't have physical bodies like we do. They're spiritual beings, and they are God's ministers and messengers. They come to serve and speak on behalf of the Lord. And so God has a message he's going to send to Joseph, and he sends an angel to deliver that message. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, so he's a descendant of King David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. The angel says, it's a miracle. She didn't sin. She didn't do anything wrong. It's a miracle. God, the Holy Spirit has allowed her to give birth, to give conception to Jesus Christ. Now, Joseph, if he is still going to marry her, Others are not going to believe this story. He is going to live with a reputation of being with an unfaithful woman and raising another man's child. Hey, I want you to understand that in that small town, highly religious culture 2,000 years ago, he is offering his reputation to the Lord. He submitted his entire life to the Lord. Now he's going to give his reputation to the Lord. And for those of you men who are still single, I want you to see that what he is basically doing is he is marrying a single mother. Mary is pregnant, yet not married, and Joseph steps in to marry her and to adopt Jesus, and he becomes Jesus' earthly adoptive father. You men, I I want you to think, particularly those of you who are single, as you're considering maybe marrying and becoming a husband, not to overlook single mothers. You, you may pick a real gem like Mary. There, there weren't a lot of men who would have been in line to be her husband. And Joseph, I can assure you of this, he didn't regret being with this woman. She was a wonderful woman and he ended up picking up a pretty good son out of the deal, amen? It worked out pretty good for Joseph. It goes on to say, um, She will bear a son, the angel says, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. This is the reason for Jesus coming. We are sinners and we need a savior that we cannot save ourselves, that religion cannot save, that morality cannot save, that spirituality cannot save, that our good deeds cannot save, that our death cannot save, that we need to be saved. We need to be saved from sin. We need to be saved from death. We need to be saved from hell. We need to be saved from the wrath of God. And we need to be saved from our own foolish decisions. We need to be rescued. We need to be saved. And Jesus comes as our savior and his name means that God is our savior. I want you to be very careful not to allow Jesus to be put in a category with the rest of humanity. He's not just a good man, he's the God man. He's not just the best among sinners. He is the savior of sinners. He's the sinless savior of sinners. And it's all about Jesus and it's all focused on Jesus and it's all centered on Jesus. And the whole point of history is Jesus and all of scripture is leaning into Jesus. And at this point, everything culminates with the coming of Jesus. All this took place, he says in verse 22, to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Now, for those of you that may be not familiar with the scriptures, this is actually a library of 66 books written by some 40 authors over a period of a few thousand years. And what is the Old Testament has prophets who give prophecies. These are specific predictions revealed by God regarding events in the future. When written, some 25% of the Old Testament was prophetic in nature, foreshadowing the future, particularly the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. What this shows us is that God who rules over history also reveals himself in history and he does so through his word. There is no religion that has prophecy like this. There is no religious leader who has come to fulfill prophecy like this. I want you to know that this alone is the book that God wrote and that the book that God wrote is ultimately all about Jesus. It's all pointing to the coming of Jesus. And so he here is quoting from Isaiah 7, 14. It was written 700 years before Jesus was even born. And I want you to just understand the magnificence of this. 
God knows the future 700 years in advance in great detail and writes it down in the Bible so that we will trust it is his word and we will trust in his son. So he quotes Isaiah 7, 14. And this, I promise you, is what you'll probably get on a Christmas card this year. This is one of the great Christmas card verses right here. He quotes it. Isaiah 7, 14. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel. And what does Emmanuel mean? God with us. Great job, kids. That's exactly what it says. How many of you got a Christmas card this year? And it quoted Isaiah 7, 14. And Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. This is different than other religions. Other religions talk about how we can ascend up to God. No, it's about God descending down to us. It's not about us going up in pride. It's about him coming down in humility. It's not about us pursuing him, but him pursuing us. That he is Emmanuel, God with us. Friends, Jesus Christ is God. Jesus Christ alone is God. He is God with us. He is the eternal God entering into history. He is the spiritual God taking upon human flesh. We have sinned against this God. We are separated from this God. And this God has chosen in humility to come near to us and to come like us in human flesh in the form of a baby born not in wealth, but in poverty, not in a big city, but in the rural country. This is our Jesus. Not the way that we would have expected him to come or anticipated that he would come. But God always surprises us and always does what is best. The story continues. When Joseph woke from his sleep, quite a night for Joseph, big night for Joseph, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. Here's what I want you to know about Joseph. He says very little, but he does very much. That we would have more men like that. Joseph is a man who doesn't say much, but he does much. God tells him through the angel, marry her, love her, raise that boy. That is not only your son, that's my son, says God the Father. It says Joseph woke up and obeyed. Simple. And faith is often obeying simply, clearly, immediately what God has revealed. And it goes on to say, he took his wife, but he knew her not until she had given birth to a son and he called his name Jesus. He marries this young woman. He does not consummate their covenant until after Jesus is born. They will ultimately have other sons and daughters and Jesus was the oldest child in a large family. And he did everything that he was instructed to do And here we have him adopting Jesus Christ and raising him as his own son. Now, chapter two, verse one. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod, the king, behold, wise men came from the east to Jerusalem. Now these wise men, they sort of come out of nowhere. We don't know exactly where they're from. Some would say Babylon, maybe a hundred miles away. Some would say that maybe they journeyed weeks, months to get there. We know very little about them. We can come to the basic conclusion that they were pagans. They weren't Jewish. Uh, They came from another nation. They were basically like astrologers. Uh, They were probably older men. They were highly educated. They were respected in their community. Um, They also were considered very spiritual. And here they walk in to history out of nowhere and they show up looking for the Lord Jesus, the baby Jesus, saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? They're not Jews and they're looking for the king of the Jews and the king of the Jews, interestingly enough, he was not brought into this world and seated upon a throne. He was brought into this world and laid in a manger. God came very humbly into history for we saw his star when it rose and we have come to worship him. And it's an interesting story. It's almost like back in the days of the Exodus when the pillar and the cloud guided God's people and they would follow it. There's a star and they're following the star. It's like map quest for, you know, the Magi. They're just following the star to where the place that God would take them. 
When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him and assembling the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. Not everyone welcomes Jesus Christ. Not everyone is happy to see Jesus Christ. Not everyone is willing to submit to Jesus Christ. And Herod is an example of that. Back, way back in the Old Testament, there were two brothers, Jacob and Esau. Esau is a descendant of or I should say rather Herod is a descendant of Esau. Jesus comes from the family line of Jacob. An ancient conflict between these two brothers continues all the way down into the days of Herod and Jesus. History is all about Jesus, but Herod was all about Herod. Herod was a powerful, ruthless political leader. He didn't love Jesus. He hated Jesus. He didn't celebrate Jesus as king. He saw Jesus as a threat to his own power. Some of us respond to the coming of Jesus as Herod did. We don't love him. We're not happy to see him. We don't want to obey him. And we certainly don't want to view him and submit to him as king. And so there's resistance and opposition and hostility toward Jesus. I hope and I trust and I pray that that is not your reaction to Jesus Christ. That as Jesus is presented to you this evening, that your heart would not be hard like Herod's was. He would not be resistant as Herod was. Herod saw Jesus as a threat to his authority, to his wealth, to his power. And as a result, he hated and opposed Jesus. If you continue to read the story in Matthew and in Luke, you will see that Herod actually tried to murder Jesus as a baby. The story continues. Verse five, they told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for it is written by the prophet. So he brings them together and he asks, where is this Jesus to be born. And they go immediately to scripture. I want you to know that when you have questions about God, the answer is found in the scriptures. And they go to another set of prophecies given yet again, roughly 700 years prior. And he is going to quote Micah chapter five, verse two. I want you to see that the Old Testament makes promises and the New Testament records their fulfillment in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And that everything God said is true and everything God promises comes to pass just as God decreed because this is in fact the book that God wrote and it's the only book that God wrote. And the promise is given from Micah chapter five, verse two. And again, this is one of these great Christmas card verses. Many of you are gonna get Christmas cards with Isaiah 7, 14 and also Micah chapter five, verse two. And he quotes it. And you, O Bethlehem and the land of Judah, a little town, a small town, and out of the way town, I've been there, it's still not a big town, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. God promised through Isaiah, the virgin will give birth to a son who is Emmanuel, God with us. And Micah in roughly the same season prophesied, and he will be born in the small obscure town of Bethlehem. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring word that I too may come and worship him. But that's not his intent. He's lying. He wants to find Jesus, but it's not to honor him, but rather to murder him. After listening to the king, they went on their way and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose, it went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. The star is above Jesus. All the focus is on Jesus. Friends, this is the way that all of life and history is supposed to be. All of the focus, the proverbial spotlight is on Jesus. And they arrive at Jesus. I want you to see this. God loves to do amazing things to bring non-Christians to Jesus. Here, they may have ventured for months following a star. And God uses their astrological commitments, which are often pagan and godless, to even bring them to the Lord Jesus. Well, they're going to follow a star. Let's bring them to Jesus so that they will stop following the stars and they'll start following the Son of God. Some of you need to know that tonight is the day and the moment and the hour that God has chosen to save you, to bring you to the Lord Jesus. That's why you're here. 
It's not circumstance or happenstance. It's providence that God in his perfect plan has chosen to do some amazing things so that tonight you would come to Jesus as these magi came to Jesus. They were spiritual, but spirituality is not enough. They were moral, but morality is not enough. They were successful, but success is not enough. Their seeking and searching for God did not find its fulfillment until they found themselves face to face with Jesus. And so it is for you. Whatever quest, whatever search you've been on for God, for spirituality, for meaning, for value, for purpose, it only finds its fulfillment when you come to the Lord Jesus and you meet the Lord Jesus. And you, you may think that you're here because someone has brought you, a family member, a friend, a coworker, a neighbor, or you're tuning in online just out of curiosity. But all of that is God's magnificent way of providence. That is him finding unique and wonderful ways to bring you to Jesus. That's what he's doing with the Magi. And that's God's illustrative purposes for us tonight. Friends, if you don't know Jesus, God's intent is that you would meet Jesus. If you do not love Jesus, God's intent is that you would love Jesus. Whatever search or quest you have been on tonight, I assure you, you can find the answer to your questions and the hope for your living in the person of Jesus Christ. And our whole goal at Mars Hill Church is to do all that we can like that star that burned brightly in the night sky, and that is to focus all the attention on Jesus and to encourage all to venture toward him. The story continues. Verse 10. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. You know they're fired up when it says exceedingly with great joy. They were so excited to see Jesus. They were so excited to meet Jesus. They were so excited to find Jesus. After I'm done preaching, we're going to sing. And when we sing, I want you to sing uh, exceedingly with great joy, right? Yell, scream, shout, clap your hands. Because when, when you know Jesus, when you meet Jesus, when you see Jesus, when you encounter Jesus, it is to be celebration and joyful. We read in Luke's gospel that when Jesus was born, the angels showed up to sing and to shout and to celebrate. And we want to do the same. And we want to join in that heavenly chorus in the rejoicing around the person and work of Jesus. And that's why we're here. We're here tonight to celebrate Jesus. We're here tonight to rejoice in Jesus. We're here tonight because Jesus has invited us into his presence as his people. And there's so much to be happy for. Amen? That's why we're here. Amen, said the little guy. (laughs) Out of the lips of infants, the Bible says that God ordains praise. Verse 11, and going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. You mothers need to get this picture in your mind. Here's, Here's Mary holding her baby. How many of you mothers know what this feels like? Here's Mary holding her baby. A lot of pressure on a teenage girl, amen? He's God. Don't drop him. We have no idea what will (laughs) happen. How many of you high school gals, you're not ready for this kind of responsibility? You see this wonderful picture. They walk in the house and there's Mary. Ladies, what this does, this provides particular honor for motherhood. This means that motherhood is a ministry. It's a very important ministry. There was no one on the earth doing anything more important than being Jesus' mom. A lot of people were doing a lot of important things on the earth, but nobody was doing anything more important than Mary. Sometimes being a great mom is the most important ministry on the earth, and we want to commend and thank you, mothers. And we want to, we want to honor motherhood. It's amazing that, that God came into history and he entrusted himself to a mother, and then he's, he's allowing children to be born into history and he's entrusting them to mothers. My mom is here tonight. I love you, mom. Thank you for being my mom. My wife is here tonight with our five kids. Thanks for being a great mom, sweetheart. And here we see Mary holding Jesus, being a great mom, raising not only her son, but God's son. They saw the child with Mary, his mother. And what did they do? They fell down and worshiped him. Do you see it? Here are the Magi. We don't know how many Magi there were. It says there were three gifts. So we tend to guess there were three guys, but we don't know. 
But here we have grown men worshiping a baby. We have rich men worshiping a poor baby. We have men from another nation worshiping Jesus who is Jewish. We have spiritual men who have stopped just being spiritual and they have focused all of their worship on Jesus Christ, not yet performing miracles, not yet preaching sermons, not yet dying and rising for sin, just a baby. But somehow by faith, they see who he is and why he's come. And, and, and it is most likely that these are the first converts in the whole Bible, pagan magi. And these are the first worshipers of Jesus among humanity, the pagan magi. And let me say this, friends, the right posture when you meet Jesus, when you come to Jesus is this, it's to fall down and worship. It's the position of surrender. This is what a criminal does when they know that they are guilty and caught. This is what a soldier does when they know that they have been conquered in war. This is what a child does when they reach out to their father or mother. And all of this is illustrative of the right response when we're face to face with Jesus. We surrender, we've been overtaken and, and we have been loved and embraced. And they fall down and they worship Jesus Man, the right response to Jesus, particularly tonight for those of you who become Christian or are Christian, is to worship him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts. All right, kids, they brought three gifts. Do you remember what they were? What was the first gift? Gold. Second gift? Frankincense. Third gift? Myrrh. You kids nailed it. You're doing great. Okay, let's look at these gifts. These are kind of interesting gifts. How many of you are not going to give your kids gold for Christmas? Right? You guys are like, it's in the Bible. I thought we were a biblical family. Jesus got gold. His family was poor. Don't give me excuses. I should get gold, right? Gold. Gold is what you give to kings. It's the most precious. It's incredibly valuable. To this day, if somebody gave you gold, they'd be giving you something very lavish and extravagant. In giving him gold, they're saying, Jesus, you're the king. You're the king of kings. That second gift, frankincense, it's kind of like incense. Any of you kids have a mom who lights incense or maybe those fragrant candles, kind of like that? Incense was used by the priests in the temple. As they would offer sacrifices, the incense would help to cover the scent. In addition, the incense was sweet and it would ascend into the presence of God and it would remind them that prayer was like that. That when we pray, it's like incense. It's, it ascends to the Lord and it is sweet in his sight. Worship and praise and prayer is like that. Some of you who love to sing and you love to pray and you love to celebrate the person and work of Jesus, you're like incense. You're a sweet fragrance in the presence of God and all of your worship ascends into his presence. That's what Revelation teaches well, they bring Jesus incense and this was to be used by the priests and the priests would work in the temple, which at the time was the most holy place on earth. It was the connecting point between heaven and earth. It's where the presence of God dwelt. It's where sinners would come to be in the presence of God and have their sin atoned for, all of which was done by the priest who was the mediator between God and men. And all of this was to foreshadow the forthcoming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews says he's our great high priest. He is the temple, the place where heaven and earth interlock and connect. And he alone is worthy of worship. And he stands as, as the mediator between us and God, the, the God man, Jesus Christ. That's why God became a man, was to mediate between our sinful humanity and his holy divinity. And all of this is shown in the frankincense. The third gift is the most curious of all. It's myrrh. Some of you kids are going to think this is really odd. Some of you boys are really going to like it. Okay. Let, let's field test my idea. What do you think myrrh was for? It was for dead bodies. How many boys think that's pretty cool? Okay. How many girls think, no, it's not? What a weird gift to give a kid. How many of you tomorrow are like, uh, Merry Christmas, Johnny. Here's embalming fluid. Well, Johnny, I'm sleeping with one eye open. I don't know what my parents are trying to communicate to me, but it's, it's a little disconcerting. This was used for the preparation of the burial of a dead body. What, a, what an odd gift to bring a, a child. 
How many of you moms would be fairly offended at the baby shower? <laughs> right? If they brought like a small casket. Yeah, you, you all sort of felt it emotionally, didn't you? You were like, you just ruined Christmas. Yeah, <laughs> just ruined it. Why would they bring that gift? What a peculiar gift. What an odd gift. What a strange gift. We opened presents today. My kids didn't get myrrh. Kids tend not to get myrrh. It shows that Jesus, he's our king, he's our priest, and he's our substitute. He's our sacrifice. That the way that he would be our savior is through his death in our place for our sins. The wage for sin is death. And the options are we die or he dies, but someone has to die. And Jesus comes to live without sin and to die in our place for our sins. So Jesus grows up, he lives without sin. He goes to the cross, he dies in our place for our sins as our savior and he pays our debt of death. And then his body is prepared for burial. And the Bible says that he was wrapped in spices and linens. Myrrh is foreshadowing his death. The reason he was born is he came to die. The reason he was born is he came to die. Some of you may not know this, but this is why Christmas and Easter are connected. We don't know when Jesus was born and we don't know when Jesus died. So Christians early on said, well, we've already got two days off. Let's use them. We'll celebrate Jesus' birth in December and we'll celebrate his resurrection from death at Easter. And all of this is foreshadowed in the gifts that they bring. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. So at the first Christmas, we see three things. Number one, it's all about Jesus. It's all centered on Jesus. The whole storyline is focused on Jesus. Mary is connected to Jesus. Joseph is connected to Jesus. The Magi are connected to Jesus. Uh, Isaiah is connected to Jesus. Micah is connected to Jesus. The whole Old Testament is preparing for the coming of Jesus. Jesus comes and everything is focused on him. And literally the proverbial spotlight comes down from out of heaven so that nobody could miss it. Here he is. It's all about him. It's all about Jesus. And he's the center. And for you and I to really enjoy and appreciate this holiday season biblically, Jesus has to be, stay, and remain at the center. Number two, gifts are given. They bring gifts to the Lord Jesus, just as you and I will be bringing gifts to give to others. But number three, it is Jesus who comes to give the greatest gift. You and I are going to have gift exchanges today and tomorrow you're going to give someone a gift and they're going to give you a gift. And all of this is following in the example of both the Magi and Jesus. They gave him a gift and then he was going to go to the cross and die in their place for their sins to give them a gift. They have a gift exchange. And I have good news for you. Good news of great joy for all the people. And that is that Jesus Christ in this Christmas season, he wants to have a gift exchange with you. He wants you to give him all your sin, all your rebellion, all your folly, all your death, all your shame. He wants to give you all his forgiveness, all his righteousness, all his reconciliation, all his life, all his inheritance, all his eternity. It's not what you and I would have ever anticipated or expected that we would give God our worst and that he would give us his best, that the gift that Jesus would give us for Christmas is nothing less than himself that God gives himself as a gift because he is Emmanuel, God with us. He is our savior. He is the sinner's savior. And I love this about the Lord Jesus. And it's why we're so excited about the Lord Jesus and why we can't stop celebrating the Lord Jesus. For those of us who are Christians, this is the most amazing gift exchange in the history of the world. And so for those of you who are redeemed, we want you to be excited tonight. I want you to know that you're forgiven in Jesus, you're clean in Jesus, you're loved in Jesus. And just like Jesus was adopted by Joseph, through Jesus, you're adopted by God the Father. I want you to leave here with your burdens lightened and with your hope elevated. We want you to enjoy the person and work of Jesus. Give him all of your sin, receive all of his great joy. For those of you who are religious, you're moral, you're spiritual, you're here because it's that time of year again. We want you to know that it is not about religion. It's about redemption. It's not about you being a good person. It's about you worshiping the perfect God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
We don't want you to try harder. We don't want you to do better. We don't want you to try to clean up your life so that you can come to him. We don't want you to try and pretend that you borrow the faith of your parents or your grandparents. We're appreciative that you're here. We love you. We believe in the providence of God that he has you here to give yourself to Jesus, to give your sin to Jesus, to give your life to Jesus. You cannot simply borrow spirituality from your parents and grandparents like the Magi. You need to make your own journey and fall down on your face in the presence of the Lord Jesus and worship him as God. And if you've never done that, I would implore you, I would beseech you, I would beg you, I would invite you. Give up on religion and welcome Jesus for redemption. And thirdly, some of you are just rebellious. You're not yet redeemed, you're not religious, you're just rebellious. You've lived a life of sin and folly and rebellion. There are things you have said and done that you are ashamed of and embarrassed by. Jesus already knows them. Jesus already loves you. Jesus is absolutely inviting you to be forgiven by him, to be loved by him, to be saved by him, to be served by him. There's nothing you have done that Jesus cannot forgive. There is no circumstance that you've gotten yourself into where Jesus will not enter and serve and help. And so if you know the Lord Jesus, I want you to celebrate. And if you don't know the Lord Jesus, I want you to come to know the Lord Jesus, and then I want you to celebrate. Father God, thank you for the opportunity to teach the Bible here at Mars Hill Church. I absolutely love opening the Bible and talking about Jesus. Holy Spirit, I ask right now that you would awaken faith and give spiritual life to those who do not know you. Maybe they're rebellious and they know that they're far away from you. May they draw near to you tonight. Lord God, I pray for those who are religious and they they think that they know you, but they don't. They know about you. They're like Herod. They know a little bit of Bible. They know a little bit of history. They know a couple facts, but they don't have love in their hearts. I pray, Lord God, that you would soften their hearts and change their minds. I pray that you would bring them to the Lord Jesus. And Lord Jesus, as we think of the Magi being the first converts and worshipers, We thank you that tonight we can join them, that we can have rejoicing of exceeding and great joy, that we can come before you and have that amazing exchange where we give you our sin and you give us your righteousness, where we give you our death and you give us your life. And Lord Jesus, we come to rejoice. We come to celebrate because all of scripture is true. The Magi knew so less than we do. They didn't see you grow up. They didn't hear you preach. They didn't watch you rise from the dead. And they trusted what little revelation they had. We have so much more. May we trust in you so much more. And Lord Jesus, I thank you. I thank you that you came into history. I thank you that you came as God among us. I thank you that you lived without sin and that you died for our sin and that you rose as our savior, that you're alive and well today, ruling from heaven and that you're coming again to judge the living and the dead. And Lord God, I thank you for the opportunity that we have at Mars Hill Church to celebrate you. I thank you for our friends through Mars Hill Global who are tuning in. I thank you to volunteers who have given of their Christmas Eve to serve us. I thank you for the staff and their families who have made this all possible. I thank you for my friends, my brothers, Pastor Dave and Pastor Sutton, and the great team I get to work with here at Mars Hill Church. And Lord Jesus, I'm so happy that the last word I get to say this year is Jesus. Amen.